Welcome back, everybody. You're watching the Law and Crime Network. We were carrying for you live a press conference from California involving details of the arrest of the suspected Golden State killer, the individual Joseph James D'Angelo, suspected after all these years of 12 murders, 51 rapes, 120 home invasions from 1974 to 1986. To help us break down what we heard, two guests are on the line here on the Law and Crime Network. Adam Sostrin is an attorney in California. He's joining us live. Also along with us today, Helen Morrison, who is a forensic psychiatrist who herself has interviewed more than 100 serial killers. Great perspectives on this discussion. Adam, I want to start with you. We heard a lot about the DNA used here. Let's break it down because the authorities were pretty coy on exactly how they did this, but attorneys like you and I know exactly how they did it. When they said discarded DNA, they basically took something. It could have been a cigarette butt, a piece Correct. of garbage, a straw, something like that, that this guy that they had been honing in on had been left behind. They took it. They tested it. It matched what they had in a cold storage locker from that crime scene after all these years. That's how it went down discarded property the Supreme Court ruled years ago can be collected if it's outside the curtilage of a home it's not on your person okay it's discarded no it. privacy right this is how it went down right That's correct you know it's absolutely abandoned uh, you said it correctly with respect to the law uh, this was this was a real success a real coup for them uh, obviously this was a an absolute terror of a person uh, he committed uh, many atrocities for over a decade uh, it worked. Uh, the DNA collection efforts worked. In California, uh, where I am, we have something called Prop 64. Anytime somebody commits a felony, uh, their DNA is taken and stored. And it happens with any of my clients. Uh, if you're a sex offender, uh, they also take your DNA with the hopes that someday uh, this can match, uh, match up with somebody uh, who committed crimes like this or of a lesser nature. But uh, it certainly worked in this case. Yeah, now let's uh, break this down a little bit further here. This particular suspect is facing uh, capital murder charges, okay? So we're talking about top charges here, along with several special circumstances. One was multiple, multiple murders, one was rape, and one was burglary. So three special circumstances, along right. with the capital murder charge. You practice in California. Can you break that down for us? Well, he's in... He's in deep, deep, deep trouble. Uh, there's no offers that any prosecutor uh, would make to this individual. Uh, that's why the attorneys there or the district attorneys that spoke said they see this as going to trial. That's precisely what's going to happen. Uh, he's facing multiple uh, life sentences. Uh, you know, so the issues are going to be uh, how was the evidence collected? Was it lawful? Uh, and how good was it? And, and but it's, you know, if the person indeed made a confession, well, then there you have it. Uh, he's going away forever. Yeah, um, that, that's the bottom line here. Now, interestingly, bottom from uh, from a prosecutorial standpoint, we're talking about 10 counties, and we saw a parade of prosecutors in that press conference. I want to get to that a in a minute. But, Helen, I want to bring you into this. You've interviewed 100, more than 100 serial killers. Yes. What What's going on inside this guy's mind? He does all this between 1974 and 1986. He stops. You fast forward to 2018, he gets caught. What's going on inside this guy's mind? Now or then. Uh, we have to look at him as basically a person who will probably, to probably told somebody that he had done this, but he went, did, went underground. They very frequently will kill a lot of people in a short period of time and then they do something stupid and get caught. Now, he just happened to slide through everything. He was able to get away with these for a long, long period of time. And he probably would not have been caught if it hadn't been for DNA. He, he is, I'm sure, shocked that he was found. And he's not going to be very, very cooperative with the police. That's interesting. Now, we also know that this suspect was a Vietnam vet. Does that play any role in what's going on here? No, it doesn't. It does not play any role? No, it doesn't. I've, I've somebody said that he had PTSD and was c killing because of that, I would 
definitely, definitely say no. It has nothing to do with it. He was also a former police officer, and we heard some questions there at the press conference as to whether or not this guy was perpetrating these crimes while he was driving around on patrol or actually getting paid by the taxpayer's dime. Does that play into this at all? What, what's your it's, analysis of that? It's possible that he had freedom to get into these places. He had his uniform on. What better thing to have but a police uniform to stop so, somebody to say, oh, Adam, your thoughts on that? Well, it's just the scariest thing in the world. Uh, you know, here we are. We're supposed to put our, our faith in these people to protect us. But when then they use, uh, you know, the weapons and tools we give them to do so, and they use it against us, uh, you know, how vulnerable uh, does that make any of us? Uh, it, it's, it's truly unspeakable. Uh, what occurred is it's, it's just incredible. Yeah, I mean, if that's indeed what went on, I mean, that would be one of the biggest shocks as part of this, you know, but we don't know that for sure. No. Is it possible right. that it was just simply knowledge of police techniques, Helen, that may have led this guy to act in a certain way? I mean, one of the accusations is he would bust into these places, and if it was a man and a woman, a husband and wife, whatnot, that he would tie them both off up and, and stack dishes as bizarre as it sounds, on top of the man and say yeah. that if those dishes fall over while I'm raping your partner, then I'm killing you both. That's right. Unreal. 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 Well, you know, you could certainly make a movie out of this person. It's like Son of Sam or, or something similar like that. I mean, this, this person was a, a truly evil human being. Uh, and now we finally have his picture and you can uh, put a a picture of the evil, I suppose. But he's going to have his day in court. He has a right to have representation, and, and we'll see how that goes. Yeah, I mean, is there anything else that, uh, after having listened to that, Helen, that uh, you can sort of add to give us a better picture of this guy? I think that he fits the profile of most serial killers. He was basically a person who had a family, had a wife at, at some point in time, had kids, and seemed to live an ordinary life. And he, he was always able to... He was always able to find his, his, his acts. Yeah, I mean, so it's not necessarily somebody who's uh, li living on the shadows of society no. here. I mean, this is somebody who's out in the open. He had a gun and a badge. Okay, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you're saying probably look pretty normal on the outside. They all do. They all look very normal. And when everybody can, is always astounded, saying, why did he, he did it? I don't believe it. What have you learned from the 100 interviews you've done with other serial killers? Why do they do it? There is no one reason why they do it. There's no explanation for it. It's not anger at people. It's not anger at, at uh, a certain population or a certain person. They just do it to do it. It is all they need to do. That's all they have as a motive. That's so, so they perhaps just, they even do more it scary. Because, uh, I'm sorry. So they just do it because at the, for whatever reason, they feel like they just want to try doing it. And they're truly sociopathic, and you'll never be able to find them or pick them out. Is that correct? If they were sociopaths, we could do something with them. They are much more primitive than sociopaths. Hmm. Uh, and one thing that we're all looking at here is the comparison of the mug shot of the suspect as he sits right now, 72 years old, mm -hmm. and comparing it with those old sketches. And, and of course, everybody's trying to play the game is to figure out whether or not that mugshot that you see right there, 72-year-old Joseph James D'Angelo, in any way looks like any of the old artist renditions of what this guy may have looked like. Either of you care to jump in and share an opinion? Uh, it's kind of hard to tell, um, but I mean, he's clearly a, a, a white man and he's a white younger man in those other images and he has a long face, uh, so I think that's the best I can do at this time. Aaron. 
Yeah, this will uh, this will involve many uh, many more questions. Uh, ten counties involved here, Adam Sostrin. You're an attorney. Right. Have you ever heard of a defendant who needed to face charges in possibly ten counties? Well, you know, it's sort of like that, uh, but much worse, like that gymnastics. Uh, coach that, you know, we had so many episodes on. Uh, there were so many, uh, m multiple hundreds of victims. And so those are types of cases that can take place in multiple counties. What's going to happen here is, and I've never heard of 10 counties, is uh, perhaps each county is going to have its chance at justice. So as soon as he gets sentenced in County 1, he's going to go to County 2. He's going to go to County 3. He's going to go to County mm -hmm. 4. Uh, and I just hope for uh, the public that he doesn't get uh, any kind of a celebrity uh, that perhaps he might be hoping for and that this goes away as fast as possible and that we don't see this person, uh, you know, as soon as possible. But, of course, he does get his day in court. And, again, uh, you know, he's presumed innocent. And we'll see if the, uh, if the state did everything right with respect to the evidence gathering, like I've already mentioned. Yeah, Helen Morrison, you've interviewed more than 100 of these serial killers. You sort of perked up a bit there when uh, Adam mentioned maybe this guy's out for some degree of notoriety. Is that possible here? No, they don't really care. A lot of people say that they want a, a notoriety. They want a lot of attention. That's not true. They just do it to do it. Well, we've got 10 potential counties here. Adam, is it also possible that we could see um, only some of the suspected crimes prosecuted? Because some are going to be clear cut because apparently there's DNA evidence. We learned that. We know that. OK. Right. Um, but it's possible that back in, you know, 1970, these crimes were 1974 to 1986, mm -hmm. 1974 and even 1986, nobody was really thinking about preserving this in cold storage lockers in police departments or even in crime labs back then. Is it possible that some of these cases might just go unprosecuted from a criminal justice perspective because it, the path to a prosecution just wouldn't have enough evidence? That's correct. Well, it's my understanding that there may be, let's say, perhaps some other other victims. Uh, and of course, they're never, unfortunately, they're not going to have their day in court. And that case isn't going to be prosecuted. But there is no statute of limitations with respect to murder. And so provided they have the evidence for it, uh, they can go forward on each and every one of those cases. Uh, you know, if, it, if it's uh, strong enough, they can. If it's slightly strong, they can. And if maybe they don't have a winner, they can uh, with respect to one case. But there are so many charges here uh, that the person's facing. Uh, you know, capital murder charges, uh, the death penalty, multiple life sentences, so it won't matter. Either way, uh, some type of justice is going to be served, I imagine, under these circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear that as well. You know, look, I mean, if they can link him to all the crimes and they, they only charge him and catch him on a couple, then, in, mm -hmm. you know, in theory, we, we do have justice here, even if the actual victim's name on the complaint is uh, not a universal list. So uh, another question I had here for you, Helen, we know that this defendant, this suspect, back when he was committing crimes, is said to have taken some kind of weird tokens, some mementos, I guess, from the scene. You've got jewelry, you've got other mm -hmm. items that apparently had been taken. Uh, what do you make of that? Is that something uh, that's common? Is it uncommon and why? It's very, it's common that they take tokens or they take a souvenir and they keep it as if it's a reminder because they don't really remember mm -hmm. all of the details or the people, but they'll remember this token that they have, that, that this proof that they did it. And, and some of these things, apparently, the guy didn't even take with him and, for instance, bring to his own house. He left them outside of the scene or, or something mm -hmm. like that. Does that make any logical sense to you? No, it doesn't. And they don't make logical sense at all. The serial killer doesn't make logical sense. It just yeah, uh, is. They just, it is, it is. I, I, Helen, I can't even imagine all these interviews that you've had uh, these stories must be so interesting. Uh, you must have an amazing, incredible perspective on these people. Um, but Aaron, also, thank, I want to thank you for having me on. As you can see right now, I'm in East L.A., uh, close to the East L.A. courthouse, and I have to actually go back to court. 
Oh, you have to, you have to go to work. Well, Adam Sostrin, I, I, I didn't know you had a hard out time. I apologize. But I was getting ready to wrap this up anyway. So we have brought you a lot of detail about the so-called Golden State Killer. We've got an arrest, 72-year-old Joseph James D'Angelo. We heard about the DNA. We heard that it was discarded DNA that this guy left somewhere. And they were able to match that up with something that had been saved from a crime scene sometime between 1974 and 1986. Twelve murders, 51 rapes, 120 home burglaries, a long list of charges Unreal. against this individual. Thanks a lot for joining us, Adam Sostrin, criminal defense me. attorney out of California, also Helen Morrison. Thank you. All right, we're going to continue to take a look at the Sean Great case out of Ohio. That's the live trial that we're covering right now on the Law and Crime Network, where we're always covering live trials and hearings. This also is a heinous case involving what you could call a house of horrors, where a victim who was tied up, attacked, restrained, was able to, after a lengthy several day long period of abuse, get a hold of a phone and call 911 when the suspect, Sean Great, was sleeping off after a lengthy attack. He was resting, she got a hold of the phone, she called the authorities, that led to an investigation, and they found dead bodies sealed up around the house. It was a horrific scene. We have seen pictures from inside the house. We have heard from the investigators who went into the scene. I want to pick up where we left off with some of our review in that case. Normally, it would still be going on, but they broke a little bit early today. Uh, you didn't really miss much. They broke right around the time the press conference began in the Golden State Killer case. So let's pick up our review of that case. Officer Mark Boggs was of the Mansfield Police Department. He was on the witness stand. 